I want to thank God for every one of you here present. To Sister Louise Patterson, the wife of our leader, Bishop G.E. Patterson. To all the members of the Temple of Deliverance Church, thank you so much for letting us borrow your pastor and allowing him to be our leader. To all the people of the Tennessee Fourth Jurisdiction, Bishop Maynard and all who are involved therein, Bishop Patterson was a part of you, the founder of your jurisdiction. To all the members of the general board, second assistant Newell Haynes, thank you Bishop Chandler Owens for that excellent introduction. To our Mother Rivers, to the Board of Bishops, Chairman Sheard, members of the Judiciary, members of the Pastors and Elders Council, to all the people of the Lord, especially to our ecumenical guest, Bishop Ellis and all of you. You honor us in such a wonderful way by your presence here on this day. Everybody just reach over and shake hands with somebody. Tell them I'm glad to see you. Now we've been in church for a long time today. This is the end of a series of services. I know the family is very weary, very tired. But I believe somebody's going to pray as we we share what the Lord has spoken to our hearts. Bishop G.E. Patterson and I met in the late 1950s. We were still in our teenage years. He was my senior in age by one year and by length of ministry about six months. Even then, he dressed like a preacher, acted like a preacher, looked like a preacher, always wore a suit and tie. Four of us young preachers during our teenage years rode together from Tennessee to California in my Chevrolet. Three of us were dressed casually, trying to get across the desert of New Mexico and Arizona. He kept that suit and tie on all the way across the desert. He gave me one of his high school graduation pictures and signed it. At the age of 18 or 19, Bishop G.E. Patterson. Even then, he knew it was his destiny to become a bishop of the church. I was so impressed by his ministry. I was so impressed by his preaching. He would alternate with his father between the two churches that his father served, one in Detroit, the other in, Memphis, in Memphis. And he was mature and advanced in ministry far beyond his years and far beyond his peers. I was so honored and pleased when we conducted a revival together at his father's church here in Memphis and also to have him to preach a series of services at my father's church in San Diego, California. And our friendship continued over the years. I married the wonderful May Lawrence who has labored to bring my visions to pass and who has beautified my work and beautified my life. And a short time later, he married the wonderful and impressive Louise Dowdy, who by her royal presence dignified him all the more. Miss Louise Patterson, without question, has been a loyal, loving protector, caregiver, and supporter of her husband. It's been a wonderful adventure to observe the journey of Bishop G.E. Patterson over the years. He's founded churches, carried on a dynamic crusade, television ministry preached in a host of 
crusades and conferences raised the temple of deliverance to the level that it's one of the premier churches on the face of the earth. But then if his career was not already outstanding and illustrious enough, he descended to the highest leadership position of the church of God in Christ. And for six glorious years, he led us. What a joy it was to stand with him, by him, and support him in the leadership of our church. Morning Manor services took us to unbelievable levels of inspiration. His annual messages were masterpieces of biblical exposition and insight. His singing took us back to the glory days of the church and his generosity made him a model of how leaders ought to give back into that which they lead. The positions he led the church to take on war, on abortion, his response to the tsunami and the hurricane Katrina, the aid he provided for the victims combined to define Bishop G.E. Patterson as a world-class visionary leader and man of God. <clears throat> Bishop Patterson was in a very special way God's man for this day. He loved his God, he loved people, he loved his wife, he loved the church of God in Christ. Now his seat is empty. His place is unoccupied. For the first time in years, he's missing from the ranks of those who are still serving God on this earth and in their physical bodies. How do you cope? How do you function when someone you've loved and someone you've depended upon is missing? When we read the Gospel of John, chapter 2, verse 1, verse 2, and verse 12, we sense that the list of persons mentioned in that passage is incomplete. Somebody is missing. For John 2 and 1 reads, on the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. Verse 12 says, after this he went down to Capernaum. He, his mother, his brothers, and his disciples. And they did not stay there many days. These verses indicate that Jesus, his mother, his brothers, and his disciples attended a wedding feast and then traveled together to Capernaum. Conspicuously absent from the list of those who went to the wedding celebration and who traveled together to Capernaum is one name. That name is the name Joseph. Joseph, the husband of Mary who was the mother of Jesus. Joseph is missing. And the consensus of a host of biblical scholars is that Joseph, the one who served as the earthly stepfather of Jesus, has already passed away. Now the question that confronts my mind is why was Joseph not allowed to live longer? How could Jesus, with all of his power, allow one who had done so much for him to die without having the privilege of seeing the ministry of Jesus unfold? So let's talk about when someone is missing. Will you look towards your neighbor and say, when someone is missing. History says very little about Joseph. Most of us spend very little time thinking about Joseph. 
But Joseph, like our presiding bishop, has to have been one of the most noble characters in all of history. Think of it, of all the people on the face of the earth, God chose Joseph to watch over history's greatest treasure. Why would God choose Joseph to be the guardian of the Messiah? Joseph and Mary were engaged to one another, and engagement then meant more than it does now. But they were not yet married to one another, and before they were married and before they were sexually involved with one another, Mary informed Joseph that she was pregnant. She further informed Joseph that the pregnancy was the miraculous work of the Holy Spirit and that she had not been involved with a man. I'm glad Joseph was not like most men. Some men would have immediately tried to destroy her. Others would have deserted her. But Joseph paused to think and to consider his options. Matthew 1.19 says that Joseph was a just man. It is also apparent that Joseph was a godly man. He did not know what to think about Mary's story, but he knew he was not obligated to marry a woman who was pregnant with a child that did not belong to him. But if he left her without explanation, people would think that the child was his and that he was not man enough to bear up to his responsibility. But on the other hand, if he loudly proclaimed his innocence from the housetops, he might cause her to be stoned as an adulteress. And if she was telling the truth and he caused her to be stoned, he would negatively affect all eternity and commit a great wrong. And so he thought about these kinds of things and those are the kinds of things that just men and godly men think about. There's such a need for just and godly men in this day. Presiding Bishop G.E. Patterson was a just and a godly man. A host of issues come before the presiding bishop and before the general board, and it has been amazing to see Bishop Patterson resolve those issues justly. And he was not only just, but he was godly. He was a worshiper. All of us have been lifted on the wings of his praise and of his worship. He was a master of worship and praise. But not only was Joseph just and godly, he, like Bishop G.E. Patterson, was thoughtful and deliberate. He did not just do things, he thought about them. He deliberated regarding them. He was not emotional and impulsive, and so few people look at the pros and cons of their intended actions and endeavors. So few people consult with people who know and who have tried it before. They launch entrepreneurial endeavors and career ventures without adequate prior forethought and then they are surprised when their efforts fail but Joseph like Bishop G.E. Patterson was sensitive to and responsive to the voice of God on four separate occasions God directed Joseph in dreams and Joseph always obeyed in the first dream God told Joseph not to be afraid to marry Mary and Joseph Obeyed. In the second dream, God warned that Joseph uh, was to carry Mary and the child into Egypt, and Joseph obeyed. In the third dream, God sent him back to Israel, and Joseph obeyed. And in the fourth dream, God sent them to live in Nazareth, and each time Joseph obeyed God. And when he did, he, Mary, and the child escaped danger, and they escaped harm. The church is blessed when it has a leader who has his mind made up that he's going to obey God. Joseph was a responsible person. He respected what God was doing in the lives of those around him. And he helped them pursue God's plan for their lives. Joseph worked hard as a carpenter. The fact that the Messiah lived in his home did not cause him to seek a free ride. He did not feel that he was above manual labor. 
but he shared the skills of his trade with Jesus and he so respected what God was doing in Mary's life that though he married her he was willing to defer sexual involvement and gratification for months until after the Christ child was born passions and desires are meant to be controlled they're meant to be directed you cannot do everything you want to do and when Jesus needed to be about his heavenly father's business Joseph silently consented as near as we can tell Joseph's behavior was above reproach. He played his role and performed his responsibilities excellently. Now, Jesus is about to perform his first miracle. Joseph is not alive to see it. Most biblical scholars say that Joseph by this time has died. And as we say bravo and well done to Joseph, we must all say, also say bravo and well done to Bishop G.E. Patterson. What a glorious life he lived. What a wonderful legacy he has left behind us. And I think we ought to clap our hands and give a standing ovation to a great leader and a great man of God. Come on, let me hear you clap your hands and praise God. You may be seated. But does it not seem that Joseph's good character, does it not seem that the presence of God and of the Son of God in his home would have guaranteed him long life? and would have guaranteed him good fortune. Does it not seem that Joseph would at least have been allowed to see some of the things that Jesus did when his ministry was in full blossom? After all, Jesus Christ lived in the house with him. But Joseph never saw Jesus as he ministered to the multitude. Joseph never heard the Sermon on the Mount. Joseph did not see the great miracles that we read about in the Word of God. This blessed family, more precious than any family in the history of the world, was struck by a tragedy that left a gaping hole in their lives and left a gaping hole in their hearts. And I suppose that I've been divinely compelled to deal with this issue because all of us have observed similar scenarios in our lives. All of us have been similarly bereaved. All of us have been deprived of something very valuable to us. All of us still quiver from the pain and shock of hurt and sorrow that has come into our lives. All of us have seen the lives of good young people snuffed out at what seemed to be the beginning of their journey, their hopes and dreams unfulfilled, their potential untapped. We've seen the best of us snatched away while evil men live on and on and on. We've seen tsunamis and violent hurricanes. We've seen senseless acts of terrorism and insane assass assassins. And the faith of many of you have been tested because things have happened in your life that you feel ought not have happened. But if the home of the Son of God was visited by an untimely death, then we ought not feel singled out when death visits our home. Oh, can I say that again? I wish I had some praying saints in here. If the home of the Son of God was visited by an untimely death, then we should not feel singled out when death visits our home. Oh, how we loved and how we respected our presiding bishop, G.E. Patterson. 
It seemed that there was so much still for him to do. And it seemed that there was so much still for Joseph to do. But with tears in his eyes, Jesus followed the funeral procession to the place of burial. With sobs on his lips, he observed them as they deposited the body of the man whom he loved most on earth into the bowels of the ground. Unexplainable painful experiences are the common lot of humanity. Will you look over towards your neighbor and just tell your neighbor, un neighbor unexplainable, unexplainable painful events are the common lot of humanity. Even the Son of God was not exempted from them. Jesus later on in his life would cancel and break up funerals. But his stepfather's funeral was a funeral that he did not cancel. That he did not break up. What do you do when you don't get your miracle. There was no miracle to extend the life of Joseph. And the fact that there was no miracle makes Hebrews 4, 15 all the more relevant and meaningful for me. For it says, we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was at all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. And let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Pain and sickness and death are a part of living on this earth. Paul said this earthly house, this tabernacle is going to be dissolved. And you need to know that we have an enemy who opposes good God and who opposes the people of God. And if he launch an attack against the family of Jesus Christ, he will launch an attack against your family. Get ready because there's a war going on. And in a war, there is strain, and there's pain, and there is violence. And Paul said, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this age. God is establishing his kingdom. God is bringing glory to himself and salvation to the earth. And when you join with God in the pursuit of the work of God, desire, deprivation, and sacrifice, and pain, and suffering are always involved. If you live for God, you're going to go through something. We saw our presiding bishop as he went through holding his head high, walking like a soldier, even though disease was racking his body and pain was coming up against him. And I know that there are times when things look bad to us. They look bad right now. But it just came by to tell you that God don't see like we see. And God does not plan like we plan. How many of you know that God moves in mysterious ways? God takes the things that are not and he uses them to bring the things that are to nothing. And he takes the things that are not and brings great things into existence. We think of time, but God thinks of eternity. We look at what we can see, but God looks at what we cannot see. We feel that life is on this side of the grave, but God sees life on both sides of the grave. The things that are issues to us are not issues to God. And while we're upset and concerned, God is saying, no problem. We're looking at the caterpillar, apparently dead, wrapped up in the cocoon but God is looking at a beautiful butterfly flying high in the sky. We see the grave, but God sees the resurrection. We see things as they are. God sees them as they are not. As you can see, I'm wearing some glasses today. I wear these glasses because I'm nearsighted. That means that I can see things up close better than I can see things that are far away from me. My glasses are, are, are bifocal, which means when I look out the bottom of them, I can see what's up close. 
but then they also enable me when I look out of the top of them uh, to see what is far away. And spiritually, most folk are just nearsighted. But the Bible helps us to be bifocal. Will you ask somebody, do you have your bifocals on? Uh-huh. Paul said, listen, when I, I look out one pain, the outward man is perishing. But when I look out from the top, the inward man is being renewed day by day. Child of God, if something bad has happened in your life, if something is missing from your life, don't you dare stop trusting God. When you look over at your neighbor and say, don't you dare stop trusting God. God, e even when you can't trace God, trust God. The Bible says we walk by faith, not by sight. I don't look at what you can see, look at what you cannot see. Uh, and, and so if somebody's missing from your life, keep on trusting God. Keep on seeking God's will. Keep on seeking God's glory. Uh, uh, just believe that, that God is going to be with you just like he's been with you all the time. Somebody said it was grace that brought me safe thus far. Uh, and that same grace. Oh, look over at your neighbor and say the same grace. That same grace is going to uh, lead us on. He that hath begun a good work in you shall perform it until the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, listen, if something is missing in uh, your life, find something to celebrate about. Now, now Joseph was gone, but Jesus had spoke to the family and he had even spoken to Joseph during his illness. He explained to them that the very purpose for which he had come to earth was that he might defeat the death that seemed to be coming upon Joseph. He informed Joseph that, that dad, you're just going to go ahead like real good fathers do. And, and that we're going to follow you. We're all going to join you in heaven after a while. And even Joseph, believing what Jesus had said, and the word of God told the family, don't worry about me. And so after Joseph had departed, Jesus and Mary and the family uh, decided that they could not allow themselves to be paralyzed forever by their grief. Living in the same house with the son of God makes it very difficult for you to be sad and forlorn very long. Listen, let Jesus come in the house, Sister, G, Sister Louise. Let the Holy Ghost minister to you. I, I, I know that there's going to be pain and, and a void in your heart, but if Jesus is there, you may cry and grieve for a little while. But after a while, you're going to have the power to get up and to celebrate. From Psalm 16 and 11 says, You will show me the path of life. And in your presence is fullness of joy. And at your right hand are pleasures evermore. So this little family decided we're going to let God embed some joy in our hearts. And it's time for us to celebrate. So they decided that they were going to go to the wedding celebration. And I would say to you, even in your grief, temple of deliverance. Even in your grief, fourth jurisdiction of Tennessee, you've got something to celebrate. Celebrate what Bishop Patterson preached. He preached Christ crucified. He preached Christ hung on a cross for the sins of the world. He preached Christ who died on the cross and was buried in the grave. He preached Christ who grabbed death by the collar and shook death until death turned him loose. He preached Christ who arose from the dead. Jesus is alive. And that's what Bishop Patterson preached. I serve a living savior. And if Jesus is alive, then G.E. Patterson is alive. 
because the same spirit that quickened the mortal body of Jesus will also quicken our mortal bodies and to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord we've got something to rejoice about for Paul said rejoice in the Lord always and he said I've learned in whatever state I am therewith to be content I know how to be abased I know how to abound I have learned both to be full and to be hungry and then he said I can do all things through Christ that strengtheneth me you might feel like you can't make it you might feel like you can't go on but church of God in Christ we can do all things through Christ that strengtheneth me and I just want to know are there any hallelujah anyhow people in the house of God hallelujah anyhow and Habakkuk said though the fig tree may not blossom nor fruit be on the vine though the labor of the olive shall fail and the field shall yield no food though the flock shall be cut off from the fold and there be no herd in the stall yet will I rejoice I'm going to joy in the God of my salvation we can rejoice because death is something that we don't just come to death is something that we go through you know the story of the man who would get off the bus at the cemetery every day and then he would walk into the cemetery after many days of this one of the regular passengers of the bus said to the driver why does this man get off the bus every day and walk into the cemetery the driver answered that well this man has a beautiful mansion on the other side of the cemetery and the road that led to his mansion was washed away in a storm a few days ago and now he has to go through the cemetery to get to his mansion he's not going to the cemetery but he's going through the cemetery hallelujah Bishop Patterson did not go to death he went through death and as I close I told some of you a few days ago about the young lady who boarded a plane with me a few days ago there was a farewell committee to see the young lady off they were crying because she was going to leave them they were hugging her and embracing her some of them were holding on to her but with tears pouring down their cheeks they waved goodbye to her as she boarded the airplane and so I rode on the same plane but when we got to the next city I watched that same young lady as she got off of the airplane and there was another crowd at the next airport that next crowd was not crying that next crowd was not filled with sorrow they were clapping their hands they had big signs saying welcome home they were laughing and they were jumping well we're on the sad crowd side we've got to wave goodbye to bishop g patterson we're so sad that he's going to leave us but on the other side there's another crowd jesus is the chairman of the welcoming committee and i hear jesus saying well done well done good and faithful servant enter into the joy of the lord i imagine bishop crowd bishop patterson would sing this song many times a consecrated cross i'll bear 
Till death shall set me free And then I'm going home A crown to wear For there's a crown for me And he told you a few days ago I'm going home No more sickness I'm going home No more crying I'm going home No more dying I'm going home To be absent from the body Is to be present with the Lord And somebody said This world is not my home I'm just passing through The angels beckon me Through heaven's open door And I can't feel at home In this world Anymore The Bible says That the trump of God shall sound The dead in Christ Shall rise first And we that are alive And remain Are going to be changed In a moment In a twinkling of an eye And we'll be caught up Caught up To meet the Lord In the air The sting of death Has been snatched away The power of death Has been snatched away Go ahead Say I'm dead and gone Go ahead Put me in the casket Go ahead Bury me in the grave Go ahead Say it's over now But on the third day Come on and praise him The third day Jesus got up And if Jesus got up We're going to get up It'll always be howdy howdy And never goodbye Why don't you praise the Lord Lift your hands and praise him Come on and praise him Come on and praise him Before I leave this text There are at least two more things That I need to say about this text They went to the celebration But when they went to the celebration Something happened at the celebration Will you look toward your neighbor and say Neighbor, something happens When you celebrate When they went to the celebration Jesus changed water into wine Plain, flat water Became sweet, delicious Grape juice Jesus is in the room right now And I believe that if somebody would praise him He'll turn your water into wine I believe that if you praise him he would turn your sorrow into joy I believe that if you praise him He'll turn your life around I believe that if you praise him He'll take you higher than you've ever been before Why don't you praise him? Why don't you magnify him? Why don't you glorify him? Thank you for the life of a great man Thank you, thank you that you let him live with us Thank you that he led us Thank you that he preached to us Thank you for the power in his life Come on and praise God Come on and thank God Thank you Lord Oh bless the name of God Oh bless the name of God But in verse 12 there's one more thing That I must deal with Before I leave the text They left the celebration And they went to Capernaum And the Bible says they didn't stay there They didn't stay there more than a few days Now Capernaum was ministry headquarters Capernaum was where the head office was Capernaum was where Jesus worked out of That's where he didn't, why he didn't stay there For so many days He had to get out of Capernaum After he strategized After he planned After he met with the disciples he said, it's time for us to go to work. He said, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. For the night comes when no man can work. And I still hear Bishop Patterson saying, go on with the work. Don't you dare stop because I've stopped. Go on with
with the work. It's much more to be done. There are many mountains to climb. There's much work to be done. I hear the voice of the Lord Jesus saying, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. Listen, we've got to go because our world is in great distress. We've got to go because our cities are falling apart. We've got to go because men are dying. We've got to go because we've got the answer for the problem of the world. Only Jesus can really make the difference. And the assignment has been given to us to spread the word and let men know about Jesus. And if we really want to honor this man, if we really want to give a tribute to this man, let's recommit ourselves to serve God with everything that is within us. We must be the voice of God to proclaim the gospel to the world. We've got to be the arms of God to embrace the world. We've got to be the feet of God to go into the world and spread the word. Enlarge the place of your tent. Stretch out the curtain of your habitation. Do not spare. Listen the cord. Strengthen the stakes for you shall break forth on the right and the left and your seed shall inherit nations and make desolate cities inhabited. Desolate cities need to be inhabited. Paul said we can do it. Paul said we can do it. When you look at your neighbor and say we can do it. We can do it because he's able. I said he's able. He's able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all we ask or think. He's able, we can do it, because Paul said, I know in whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he's able to keep that that I've committed unto him. Look at your neighbor and say, we can do it. I said, we can do it. Because even the youth shall faint and be weary, and young men shall utterly fall. But they, oh they, oh they, that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They'll mount up on wings just like eagles. They'll run and not be weary. They'll walk and not faint. future we're going to celebrate the past we're not going to embrace it thank God for our past thank God for great leaders thank God for great men of God thank God for great women of God we're celebrating our past thank God for a great presiding bishop thank God for G.E. Patterson thank God for his heart of love thank God for his Hallelujah. We're looking ahead. We're marching ahead by the power of God. We're moving on by the power of God. As I see the future, the future looks bright. The future looks good. And I just came by to tell you, Church of God in Christ, I see you in the future.
future and you look much better than you look right now. Tell somebody, neighbor, I see you in the future and you look much better. Tell them you look much better than you look right now. Tell one more person, I see you in the future and you look much better. You shout much better. Dress much better than your dress right now. I see you, I see me in the future, and I look much better. I'm going higher, 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 higher. Look over at your neighbor and say, hey, neighbor, when you look for me again, you better look up because I'm going higher. I feel the Holy Ghost. 